Welcome to this educational program. This module discusses a surgical treatment for kidney cancer called laparoscopic radical nephrectomy. A separate presentation entitled Understanding Kidney Cancer is also available, and it is hoped that you will have viewed this already. The information in this presentation is taken from a recent review of the medical literature and attempts to be as comprehensive as possible. However, it may not necessarily reflect the experience of your health care provider or the specifics of your situation. This program is strictly informational in nature, and no attempt is made to provide opinion or recommendation. Please feel free to view this presentation as many times as necessary. You may also use the player on your left to repeat slides or to skip through them in any order you wish. Radical nephrectomy involves the complete surgical removal of the kidney along with its surrounding structures. It is indicated for localized tumors confined to the kidney in an attempt to cure the cancer and for more advanced tumors with spread beyond the kidney to either control symptoms or to improve the results of other therapy such as immunotherapy. A laparoscopic radical nephrectomy is the same operation performed with the assistance of real-time video imaging. In this surgery, the abdomen is inflated with gas and small instruments are passed into the body to perform the operation. Several tiny cuts are made in the skin and a small incision may be made in a favorable location to remove the specimen. In this way, laparoscopic surgery avoids the more uncomfortable and larger incision of the classic open operation. The kidneys are a pair of bean-shaped, fist-sized organs situated on either side of the spine in the upper abdomen and lie behind the bowel and other abdominal organs. They are protected by the lower part of the ribcage and the spine. They are composed of many different types of tissues and cells, but broadly they consist of a filtering system, the meaty red part of the kidney called the parenchyma, and a drainage system that carries urine from the kidney down to the bladder. The renal parenchyma is divided into an outer part called the cortex, which is the filtering mechanism, and an inner part called the medulla, which is the collecting area for urine. It is easy to think of the kidney as an organ where blood goes in and urine comes out. Above each kidney lies an adrenal gland, and each kidney and adrenal gland is surrounded by fatty tissue, which is a protective mechanism in place so that the kidneys do not get damaged by trauma such as jarring accidents and direct blows. The fat acts as a shock absorber for the kidney. It also acts as a natural barrier preventing local extension and spread of kidney cancers. Around all of this is a tough fibrous membrane called gerotus fascia, which is also important in limiting the spread of cancer. Like all major organs, the kidneys are also surrounded by lymph nodes, small glands that play a central role in fighting infection and disease. The kidneys receive blood supply from usually one, but often two or more, renal arteries, which arise from the aorta, the largest artery in the body. This is the large blood vessel that takes blood away from the heart to the rest of the body. Blood drains out of the kidney through one or more large renal veins, which then drain into the largest vein in the body, called the inferior vena cava, or IVC, that drains blood from the body back to the heart. This drawing shows how the kidneys are surrounded by other organs in the body. On the right, the kidney sits below the liver, next to part of the small bowel called the duodenum, and beneath the right side of the large bowel, or colon. On the left, the kidney lies just below the spleen and stomach, beneath the left colon, and just to the right of the pancreas. The lungs and chest cavity are also in close relation to the kidneys. This is what the kidneys and other organs look like in a CT scan, or MRI where the body is viewed in slices, like cutting someone in half and looking up from the feet. Kidney cancer usually begins in the cortex of the kidney. As it grows, it is initially limited by the capsule of the kidney, then the fat, and finally, gerotus fascia. It also may grow into the adrenal gland, or into the renal vein, and even the inferior vena cava. Furthermore, it may spread into the lymph system and the lymph nodes, or into the blood vessels and out to other organs of the body. These patterns of growth and spread determine how kidney cancer is staged, which determines how it is treated. As noted, 
Radical nephrectomy involves the removal of the entire kidney, along with the surrounding fatty tissue, gerotus fascia, nearby lymph nodes, and sometimes the adrenal gland. This operation can be performed through a traditional open incision or cut in the skin, or through laparoscopy. The traditional open surgical approach is chosen for tumors growing into the renal vein or inferior vena cava, and may be chosen for very large tumors, tumors that have advanced locally outside of the kidney, when previous surgery or other circumstances would make laparoscopic surgery difficult, or when the surgeon is simply more comfortable with the open surgical approach in that situation. When the situation allows for the surgery to be done laparoscopically, however, it is usually the preferred approach. This is due to the benefits of being performed through smaller incisions, which means potentially less blood loss and less postoperative pain, with subsequently less need for pain relief drugs and faster recovery and return to normal activities. All of this is gained while still achieving the same cure rates as open surgery. Prior to coming to surgery, you will meet with your urologist, who is a surgeon specializing in the kidneys and urinary tract. A medical interview will be carried out, and your medications and allergies will be reviewed. A physical examination is performed, then testing may be ordered to assess the kidney cancer and your fitness for surgery. This testing may include blood and urine tests and a cardiogram to check your heart. Imaging, such as x-rays, CT scan, or MRI may also be performed. Staging will be performed by the physical assessment, blood tests, and imaging studies to determine if the cancer is localized or has spread elsewhere in the body. These findings are then reviewed, and treatment options, including surgery, are discussed. If you have any concerns, they should be reviewed at this time. Be sure your doctor is aware of all pertinent medical information, especially regarding the taking of blood thinners that are prescribed or over-the-counter. Ask about your medications, including what you should continue taking up to the time of surgery. Following this review, you will be asked to sign informed consent for surgery. This is a very important document which indicates that you understand why surgery must be performed, other treatment options, what surgery entails, and what the potential risks are. The side of surgery is clarified here, and you should review this before signing. The consent also allows your doctor to perform any other procedures that are deemed necessary to save your life, and to use the assistance of other medical personnel, such as other doctors, nurses, and students. Finally, the consent normally includes a note that allows your doctors to use blood or blood products if deemed necessary to save your life. If you have any objection to this, you must notify your doctor and have this section adjusted accordingly. Once the decision is made, it is time to prepare for surgery. In the days leading up to the operation, focus on living as healthy as you can, eating a balanced diet, and getting some regular exercise. Also very important is smoking cessation if you are willing to try it at this point. It has been found that if you stop smoking just prior to surgery, there are distinct benefits regarding anesthetic risk and recovery from surgery. Gathering the support of family and friends around you, as well as other patients who have had the operation when possible, can also help ease your mind and comfort you. Try to take other measures to reduce stress as well. Arrange time off work well ahead of time, and organize some help with household and other tasks before and after surgery. Learning about your condition and your surgery through programs like this can also help to relieve anxiety by removing the mystery of what is happening to you. Finally, it is important to understand and come to terms with the expectations of surgery as well as the potential outcomes. The night before the operation, eat a light meal, then take nothing by mouth for several hours before surgery. A common instruction is to take nothing by mouth after midnight on the night before the operation. However, individual instructions will vary. Try to get a good night's sleep, as it helps to go into surgery well rested. Finally, as individual situations will differ, follow the advice of your doctor or hospital regarding specific preoperative instructions. On the day of surgery, have someone drive you to the hospital and try to arrive early. You will likely first go to the admitting department or have some paperwork done to check you into hospital. You will then be checked into the surgical area 
where you will change into a hospital gown and meet with a nurse. The nurse will review your medical history and check your vital signs, including your blood pressure, pulse, and temperature. An intravenous, or IV, line will likely be started, through which you will receive fluids and later medications. At some point during this process, you will meet with an anesthesiologist who will administer anesthetic drugs and monitor your vital function during surgery. The anesthesiologist will review different anesthetic options with you and discuss their merits and potential risks. Finally, prior to surgery, you will meet once more with your surgeon and any final concerns can be addressed. If not done already, the site of surgery may be marked as a safety precaution to ensure that the correct kidney will be operated on. Once in the operating room, an intravenous or IV line will be started if not done already. You will then be put to sleep by the anesthesiologist and a breathing tube will be introduced. Other tubes and monitoring lines may then be placed, including a catheter into the bladder to monitor urine output. Other monitoring devices are also used to check your level of blood oxygen, your temperature, and your level of anesthesia, among other things. The doctors and nurses will then carefully position you on the operating table in such a way as to optimize the ability of the surgeon to carry out the operation. This drawing shows the most common position with the patient on her side and the table bent in the middle. In the case shown, the patient is positioned for removal of her right kidney. Once positioned, the skin is cleaned with special antibacterial solution and incisions or cuts are made through which plastic or metal tubes called ports are placed into the abdomen or flank. Ports are placed using sharp-tipped trocars. These ports allow introduction of a camera, carbon dioxide gas, and operating instruments into the body. There are several choices of incisions and port placement for laparoscopic radical nephrectomy, and this slide shows a typical example. Before or after port placement, carbon dioxide gas is pumped into the body to create space to work in. This process is called insufflation. There are two spaces that may be insufflated and worked in depending on surgeon preference. Most prefer to go through the abdominal cavity, called a transperitoneal approach, while some prefer to go through the flank and outside the abdominal cavity. This is called a retroperitoneal approach. Through the ports, a video camera and special long operating instruments are passed into the body and the operation begins. First, the kidney is dissected out with its surrounding fat, gerotus fascia, part of the ureter, lymph nodes, and possibly the adrenal gland. Some surgeons use special laparoscopic instruments only to do this, while others use a so-called hand-assisted technique, where a special port allows them to insert one hand into the body to help with the dissection. The kidney is now placed into a bag and removed from the body. Again, there are different ways of doing this. Sometimes the kidney is ground up or morselated, while at other times one of the port incisions will be made a little larger to allow the whole specimen to be removed intact. The incisions are then closed, using dissolvable sutures on the inside and staples or dissolvable stitches in the skin. Dressings are applied to cover the incisions. Once stable, the patient is transferred to the recovery area for further monitoring and eventually to a regular ward bed. For the first day or two after surgery, you will not take much by mouth and may not be fully mobile. For this reason, you will have special compression devices on your legs to prevent blood clots from developing. You will, however, be encouraged to move around as soon as possible, and once you are walking around well, the compression devices will be removed. A catheter or tube will drain urine from your bladder into a bag to monitor urine output. Pain control can be managed either with pills or through an intravenous line. After a while, once you begin to move gas through your system, you will be advanced to a full diet. Activity will also be increased. The compression devices will stay on until you are moving around well and the risk of blood clots has diminished. Pain control will eventually progress from drugs given through the IV to oral pain medications. The bladder catheter is removed once you are moving around well. You will be allowed to go home once your doctors and nurses are satisfied that all vital signs are stable, your bowels are functioning properly, no tubes or IV lines are in place, 
you are comfortable using only pills for pain control, and you are moving well. Once you go home, increase your physical activity as tolerated over the first couple weeks, and take care to get plenty of rest, eat a healthy diet, and keep stress to a minimum. Continue smoking cessation if stopped prior to surgery. Your doctor can prescribe medications and routines to help with this in the post-operative period. Gradually return to full activities by two to four weeks. Understand that it may take some time to feel that you are back to normal again. You may not be able to focus and concentrate as sharply as normal, and your physical energy and stamina may be diminished for a time. Sometime after you return home from the hospital, you will need to visit your doctor for a follow-up. At this visit, your doctor will check the healing of your incision and will discuss the pathology report to you. This is the report issued by the doctor in the lab, a pathologist, who inspects the kidney and tumor and examines it under a microscope. The pathology helps your doctor to decide on your follow-up schedule if necessary and if any further tests will need to be done in the future. If necessary, further treatment will be organized at that time and plans will be made for regular follow-up visits. Most kidney cancer patients undergo a regimen of regular follow-up examinations after surgery, including periodic assessment by a physician, blood tests, x-rays, and ultrasound or CT scans. The exact schedule of follow-up visits will depend on your specific clinical situation as well as the preference of your doctor. Even when kidney cancer seems to have been completely removed or destroyed, there is always a chance that it may return later on. In fact, up to 30% of tumors may recur in some way sometime after nephrectomy. It is for this reason that careful follow-up monitoring is so important. Recurrence is less likely for tumors of lower stage and lower grade. If kidney cancer recurs, treatment options may include surgical removal if there is only one or two isolated tumors, radiation therapy for bone lesions only, and or biologic or targeted therapy if the cancer has spread outside the kidney. If the opposite kidney is normal, there are usually no effects from having one kidney removed. The opposite kidney will increase activity to keep the overall kidney function normal. If the other kidney does not function properly, however, partial nephrectomy is preferred whenever possible. If not, kidney function must be watched closely, and dietary precautions, etc., may be required. Dialysis may eventually even be necessary. If the other kidney is completely absent or must also be removed, dialysis will be required, and kidney transplant may be considered later. Most patients with a good kidney on the opposite side can expect to live a normal, long life after removal of one kidney, when the cancer has been controlled. While there are no absolute special precautions for these patients, it is recommended to drink plenty of water, eat a well-balanced diet, exercise regularly, and be extra careful with contact sports. Also, maintain regular visits to your doctor. Obviously, the greatest concern for patients undergoing laparoscopic radical nephrectomy for kidney cancer is that the cancer be cured. Kidney cancer can, in fact, most definitely be cured with this operation, and the cure rates are no different stage for stage than with the open procedure. It is important to understand that cure is a difficult term to define and varies with different types of cancer. For kidney cancer, cure is generally defined as no evidence of recurrent disease after five years of close follow-up. However, later recurrences can occasionally recur. Ah. However, later recurrences can occasionally occur. It is for this reason that careful follow-up monitoring is so important. This slide shows the cure rates for kidney cancer as defined by the percentage of patients going five years with no evidence of recurrent disease. As shown here, generally, the more extensive the tumor, in other words, the higher its stage, the less likely the treatment will cure the cancer. Fortunately, when kidney tumors are diagnosed early, they are usually treated successfully, with survival rates in the order of 75 to 100 percent. The next several slides will discuss the potential risks of surgery. For most patients, laparoscopic radical nephrectomy is a straightforward and safe procedure. However, it is considered major surgery, and for some patients the situation can be quite complex. 
Overall, there is a very small risk of death during laparoscopic nephrectomy of less than 2%. Most of these likely occur in complex cases with high-risk patients and large or advanced tumors. The risk of death should be less for smaller, more localized tumors. Causes of death may include things such as excessive bleeding, heart attack, heart failure, or stroke, blood clots to the lungs, injury to other organs around the kidney, pneumonia or other infections, and kidney failure. This slide outlines the potential problems that may be encountered in the operating room during surgery. Significant bleeding to the point of requiring a blood transfusion can occur in rare cases. For this reason, blood is routinely kept available to transfuse if necessary. Several other organs are located near the kidney, and these may occasionally be injured during nephrectomy. These include the bowel, spleen, pancreas, and stomach on the left, and the bowel and liver on the right. These injuries are uncommon and usually recognized and repaired at the time. Rarely, removal of the spleen, or splenectomy, is required during a left nephrectomy. The lining of the chest cavity, called the pleura, may be cut or punctured during surgery. If a puncture is not recognized, this can rarely lead to what is called a pneumothorax, which is air in the chest cavity outside the lungs. This can put pressure on the lungs, making it hard to breathe, and it is treated by placing a tube in the chest to let the air out. Risks of general anesthesia will be outlined by the anesthesiologist and are discussed in a separate module. There are also certain rare risks associated with the special positioning on the operating table, such as nerve damage, pressure, such as nerve damage, pressure sores, and back problems. There are a few certain and important risks in the operating room that are specific to laparoscopic surgery. Depending on the situation, there is always a small risk that the operation may have to be converted from a laparoscopic approach to a traditional open surgical approach. This need may arise from bleeding during the operation, difficulty visualizing important structures, difficulty making forward progress, or an unexpected injury to a structure which cannot be dealt with laparoscopically. Trocars are solid pointed tipped pieces of metal or plastic that allow placement of ports into the body. During port placement, these trocars can accidentally poke into and injure structures in the body. A gas embolism occurs when insufflation gas gets into the bloodstream. It can cause cardiovascular problems and stroke, but is usually recognized and treated successfully. It is a rare complication and even more rarely a cause of death during laparoscopic surgery. Finally, unrecognized injury to structures in the body during surgery, especially the bowels, can rarely occur. This happens because the entire body cavity cannot be visualized and injury can occur away from where the surgeon is operating. There are other complications that may occur in the first few days after surgery. These include infections of the bladder, wound, abdomen, bowels, or IV sites. Overload of fluids given through the IV which can cause heart failure and which is more common after laparoscopic than open surgery. Gas under the skin called subcutaneous emphysema which is a short-lived situation that resolves on its own as the gas is absorbed. Ongoing bleeding from inside the abdomen or from the wound and lung problems such as an unrecognized pneumothorax, temporary poor lung function from collapsed areas called atelectasis and pneumonia. Some patients experience slow return of bowel function, called an ileus, because the bowel is temporarily paralyzed. Pancreatitis, or pancreatic fistula, are rare complications of nephrectomy, caused by injury to the pancreas with a leak of pancreatic fluid into the abdomen or through a skin incision. A collection of infected fluid in the abdomen, called an abscess, can occur from an unrecognized bowel injury. If the opposite kidney is absent or does not have optimal function, there may be a temporary decrease in overall kidney function or even kidney failure requiring dialysis, as previously discussed. Wound infections are an occasional risk of any surgical procedure and are usually prevented by antibiotics given to you prior to starting your surgery. Early or late after surgery, blood clot in the legs, called deep venous thrombosis, or in the lungs, 
called pulmonary embolus, may occur from poor venous circulation during and after surgery while the patient is immobile. This potentially fatal complication can occur with any operation, and measures are taken to prevent it, including the use of special socks or compression devices on the legs, drugs to prevent clotting, and early mobilization. This problem may occur while in hospital or rarely after discharge home. Other potential problems that can occur later on are listed here. Minor problems with the incisions are not uncommon, such as numbness of the skin around it. Actual hernias of the wound, where abdominal contents bulge into the wound under the skin, are rare. A more concerning complication is recurrence of tumor at the incision sites from spillage of tumor cells there. This complication has been reported but is rare. Delayed kidney failure may occur in cases where kidney disease progresses or develops in the other kidney. Lastly, as noted, cancer may sometimes reoccur. Once home from surgery, please call your health care provider right away if you develop a fever, if you become nauseated or start to vomit, if you have uncontrollable pain, if you develop a cough or become short of breath, if you develop swelling or tenderness in the legs, if you develop chest pain, if you have trouble urinating, or if your incision becomes red, tender, or swollen. In summary, laparoscopic radical nephrectomy involves the removal of a kidney through long instruments placed into the body through small incisions and under the vision of a telescopic camera. It is performed with the goal of curing kidney cancer. While minimally invasive compared to open surgery, it is still considered major surgery and as such a hospital stay is required. It is performed through multiple small incisions in the abdomen and flank, one of which may be extended to allow removal of the kidney. It is important to understand several important risks of this operation as outlined in this presentation. Most patients recover quickly from the surgery and in most cases the cancer can be cured. These are just a few of many resources available to educate you on kidney cancer and help you find support. These references were also used in preparing this presentation and are available at your local medical library. We sincerely hope that this module has furthered your understanding of laparoscopic radical nephrectomy for kidney cancer. We wish you the best for the future and thank you once again for viewing this educational program. Welcome to this educational program. This module discusses a surgical treatment for kidney cancer called laparoscopic radical nephrectomy. A separate presentation entitled Understanding Kidney Cancer is also available, and it is hoped that you will have viewed this already. The information in this presentation is taken from a recent review of the medical literature and attempts to be as comprehensive as possible. However, it may not necessarily with spread beyond the kidney to either control symptoms or to improve the results of other therapy, such as immunotherapy. A laparoscopic radical nephrectomy is the same operation performed with the assistance of real-time video imaging. In this surgery, the abdomen is inflated with gas and small instruments are passed into the body to perform the operation. Several tiny cuts are made in the skin and a small incision may be made in a favorable location to remove the specimen. In this way, Laparoscopic surgery avoids the more uncomfortable and larger incision of the heart called the cortex, which is the filtering mechanism, and an inner part called the medulla, which is the collecting area for urine. It is easy to think of the kidney as an organ where blood goes in and urine comes out. Above each kidney lies an adrenal gland, and each kidney and adrenal gland is surrounded by fatty tissue, which is a protective mechanism in place so that the kidneys do not get damaged by trauma such as jarring accidents and direct blows. The fat acts as a shock absorber for the kidney. It also acts as a natural barrier preventing local extension and spread of the classic open operation. The kidneys are a pair of bean-shaped, fist-sized organs situated on either side of the spine in the upper abdomen and lie behind the bowel and other abdominal organs. 
they are protected by the lower part of the ribcage and the spine. They are composed of many different types of tissues and cells, but broadly they consist of a filtering system, the meaty red part of the kidney called the parenchyma, and a drainage system that carries urine from the kidney down to the bladder. The renal parenchyma is divided into an outer part to reflect the experience of your health care provider or the specifics of your situation. This program is strictly informational in nature, and no attempt is made to provide opinion or recommendation. Please feel free to view this presentation as many times as necessary. You may also use the player on your left to repeat slides or to skip through them in any order you wish. Radical nephrectomy involves the complete surgical removal of the kidney along with its surrounding structures. It is indicated for localized tumors confined to the kidney in an attempt to cure the cancer and for more advanced tumors